In this and coming three lectures, we'll discuss metabolism. Metabolism comprises so many, I would say almost uncountable, different ways to process metabolites and their intermediates in the living system. This diagram shows only a fraction of such metabolic pathways. Um, I hope you can appreciate their complexity in the steps and the intersections here and there for multiple pathways. We'll discuss um, only critical metabolic pathways, their mechanisms, and their regulations for this four lectures. Metabolism is a sum of all biochemical transformation in the cell for sustaining the life. And its goal is to basically extract energy and or make cells own molecules from precursors provided in diet. And the components of the metabolisms are catabolism, which is the process of breaking down the molecules, and anabolism, which is the synthesis of the molecules. In detail, catabolism is the process of breaking down the complex molecules, and it results in the energy release, which means that um, this is an exergonic process, and the part of the energy will be recaptured during the catabolism. As opposed to anabolism is almost the opposite, which is the, um, the synthesis of the complex molecules from simple ones, and it requires energy input, so that's endergonic process. And anabolism starts with the simple precursors, which leads to synthesis of a variety of bigger complex molecules. There are conflicting demands of catabolism and anabolism in the cell, which are almost the opposite thing. And pathways over making and breaking down of the same molecule coexist in the cell, and many reactions are reversible. So that means catabolism and anabolism of the same molecule can happen at the same time in theory in the cell. But cells are economical, meaning that they have little or no waste. So they're going to either make the molecule or break it down, but they're not going to do the both. And this decision is depends on their needs. And cells do not make unnecessary products in terms of their energy too, so they're not going to waste in their unnecessary energy. So to better understand how catabolism and anabolism happens with that the same molecule as well as different molecules and um, their mechanisms for their uh, control um, and balance between these different um, uh, uh, processes, we need to review some relevant thermodynamic concepts that we learned uh, earlier in this course. The enzymes speed up a reaction progress to equilibrium, but which way does the reaction go in the cell? Is that the forward or the reverse reaction? So the reactions always tend to go to equilibrium, meaning that the, um, the rate for the forward reaction is the same as rate for the reverse reaction at the equilibrium. And at that point, delta G, the Gibbs free energy, would be zero. And equilibrium is characterized by a characteristic concentration of the reactants and products, especially their ratios. And for the reaction of the type A, plus B goes to C plus D with these coefficients A, B, and C, D. The equilibrium constant equals to KEQ, the equilibrium constant, um, is the concentration of the C and D divided by A and B um, concentration, which has the exponent as a C, D, and A, B, which are the, um, the coefficients here. And the, um, the reaction's driving force will be the tendency to move for, um, towards the, um, the equilibrium, which is expressed as the delta G gives free energy. And as you remember from the thermodynamics, for standard condition where the pressure is 1 atm, temperature is 25 degrees C or 298 Kelvin, and all species that are reacting are at one molar, the reaction's driving force is the standard free energy change, which is delta G naught. But some reactions involve hydrogen cation, especially in the cell, and reactions do not occur in the cell at hydrogen cation concentration um, as on one molar, so it's going to be too high. Therefore, we use biochemical center state where the, um, the pressure and the temperatures are the same and all other species are at one molar, but uh, we have some additions here as the pH equals zero and the activity of water molecules set to one. 
and uh, uh, we can relate this uh, delta g naught, which is a Gibbs free energy, to the equilibrium constant Keq. So it starts with this relationship, delta g naught equals minus rt ln Keq, and if we rearrange a little bit to get um, this Keq on our left side, then it's going to be the e uh, to the, um, the minus delta g naught divided by rt. And uh, the delta g naught is the, um, just another way to express the Keq equilibrium constant and tells which way a reaction will go if uh, you start with the standard state um, where the, um, the all the reacting species are one molar. But please note that the, um, the inverse exponential relationships exist between this delta g naught and the, um, the Keq as you can see here. Too. So uh, that means the small changes in delta G naught re will result in the large changes in Keq. So that means large positive value of delta G naught would mean the small Keq value and the reaction will go to the left as opposed to a large negative value of the delta G naught will be the, um, the large Keq value so the reaction will go to the right. And the relationship um, is again uh, the exponential, and you can see in this table that the, um, how small changes in delta g naught will result in the larger changes in Keq and vice versa. In the cell, actual delta g of the reaction may not be equal to delta g naught, which is at the standard conditions. So let's consider a reaction where A and B it becomes the um, C and D, or the reverse reaction can happen here too. Uh, we can get the relationship between delta G and delta G naught by this equation. Delta G equals delta G naught plus RT multiplied by ln, and basically the ratio of the, um, the products and the uh, reactants in their concentrations, which is C concentration, D concentration divided by A and B concentrations. And even if delta G naught is positive, so supposedly the reaction goes to left side, but the reaction can still go to right side for this delta G um, if the term RT ln, this um, Keq basically, which is a CD divided by AB in their concentration is sufficiently negative. So again, even if this is positive, if this term is largely negative, that can uh, uh, make the, um, the delta G negative, so the reaction will go right here. And again, this uh, ratio of the, um, the product and reactants has to be really small in this case to get the, um, the negative value. So imagine that the, um, the concentration of C and D is the same as the concentrations of A and B, in which case this ratio will be just 1, and ln1 is, as you know, 0. So this term would uh, become the 0 to make the delta G equals delta G naught. And if this uh, ratio is smaller than 1, then now you're getting negative values for this ln Keq. So eventually, if this, um, as this ratio gets smaller and smaller, you're going to get the, um, the more negative values here to become the um, delta G as a negative value. So again, here, it, as it says, if products of reaction are constantly removed, so um, it can be used by another reaction or so, so to get rid of this C and D constantly, then the, um, the ratio of these products and reactants is going to be kept uh, small. And that, uh, in, uh, in, in which case, this term will be uh, stay negative. So the reaction is going to be pulled to the right. Cells can drive an endorganic reaction by coupling it to an exergonic reaction. So let's consider a couple of the reactions here. A is converted to B, and the B goes to C. If we sum up these two, then we can cancel out the B to get the, um, the A to C reaction. And as you know, the delta G values of the sequential reactions are additive, so delta G naught of total reaction will be the, um, the delta G of the, um, each reactions, which is delta G1 naught and delta G2 naught, and it can be delta G3 naught too if um, more than two reactions are put together to form the, um, the one huge reaction. 
And if reaction A to B is endergonic, but the B to C is strongly exergonic, the overall delta G for the um, A to C would be negative. So it will pull the, pulls the, um, the reaction through to the, um, the right side. And this is a general way to uh, drive endergonic reactions in the cell, basically by coupling them to highly exergonic reactions uh, through a common intermediates. An example of such coupled reactions will be a phosphorylation of glucose by hexokinase. So its reaction basically um, um, is the glucose interact with the uh, inorganic phosphate to become the glucose 6-phosphate and the, um, the water molecule. And its uh, delta G0 value is 13.8 kJ per mol, meaning that this is a positive value for the Gibbs free energy at the standard conditions. So the reactions will unlikely to go to this uh, forward uh, direction. But it can be coupled to ATP hydrolysis, where this ATP is a common intermediate in the, um, the cell um, and the cellular reactions. So if you do that, again, this is glucose to become the glucose 6-phosphate. And ATP can um, react with the water to become the ADP and the, um, the inorganic phosphate. In this case, this reaction has the delta G0 value as the minus 30.5 kJ per mole, so it's a high Highly um, exergonic, meaning that delta G is negative, and the reaction will be pulled to the um, the right um, direction. And if you sum these two reactions, basically this inorganic phosphate cancels out as well as water molecule two, which leaves the um, the glucose plus ATP will um, become the um, glucose six phosphate and the ADP. And you can sum these two Gibbs free energies to get the total Gibbs uh, Gibbs free energy for the total. Reaction reaction, which is minus 16.7. Again, this is a negative value, so the overall reaction will be exergonic and the uh, uh, reaction will go this right, right side. Understanding the regulation of enzymes is key to understanding of the mechanisms of metabolism, and such enzymatic regulation controls the flow of metabolites through the metabolic pathways. And in such pathways, many reactions are reversible, especially in the cell, and they um, try to achieve the, um, the equilibrium again by following this delta G0 equals minus RT ln KEQ. But a regulated pathway must have ways to run in one direction, only that direction, or at least predominantly for that uh, uh, direction, and it depends on their needs. So. Uh, in some cases, they can actually change that too. And um, there are going to be such regulations um, that can be involved with the enzymes as well as uh, some other components. So let's consider the, um, the a reversible pathway like A converts to B and B goes to C and C changes to D in which case the reactions will proceed toward the equilibrium. And this reaction and their rate and the, um, their um, products will be uh, only regulated by the changing the concentration of its components A, B, C, and D in case of this substrate limited reaction. And the, um, it can be changed by the corresponding enzymes that are involved in each steps for the um, enzyme limited um, reaction steps. Oftentimes, enzyme-limited reaction steps are highly exergonic, and they can serve as great limiting steps in the pathway. So um, oftentimes, there are targets for the regulation for metabolism, too. And the whole pathway of the such metabolism cannot be faster than the slowest step, which is a rate-limiting or rate-determining step. There are additional solutions to um, such pathway regulation problems. One would be the compartmentalization of the, um, the forward and reverse pathways, in which case cells can independently regulate such pathways uh, differently. So um, an example would be the fatty acid, where um, its synthesis happens in the cytosol, but the fatty acid oxidation, basically, which is the breakdown of the fatty acid, happens in the mitochondria. And another uh, solution will be the, um, the diversify the forward and reverse pathways. So in which case these two pathways are not uh, the same, 
um, so the, um, the certain steps can be independently regulated in that case using the, um, some intermediate um, or the, um, some other completely different pathways but the, um, um, having the, um, the same end product and the, um, that can provide the, um, the direction of the rest of the pathway. So um, the certain enzymes are the key regulatory points in metabolic pathways, uh, the, such as committed steps and branch points and so on. So they can serve them as the um, that kind of uh, uh, key point where they can determine uh, such reactions that go either forward or the reverse. Uh, thus, we must understand how enzymes are regulated to better understand the regulation or the control of that metabolism. For regulation of metabolic pathways, these two principles are often used, feedback inhibition and product inhibition. For feedback inhibition, let's consider this reaction here where it starts with a precursor which converts to X and then A and then goes through multiple steps and branches to get the Y as a final product. If the accumulation of Y inhibits the conversion of X to A, then it will inhibit the, um, the whole branch of the pathways leading to its own synthesis too. As a result, Y concentration will also eventually drop and the branch leading to its synthesis now will be reactivated again, especially from this X to A conversion. So it leads to the, um, the increase of Y and then the, um, another feedback kicks in to regulate this X to A conversion and so on. Now this will lead to the, um, the homeostasis basically of the, um, the keeping the similar concentration of the Y. So it balances this Y depending on the, um, the cell's need. And an example for such uh, inhibition uh, mechanism would be the, um, the threonin dehydrogenase, which is synthesized on isoleucin. Another principle for regulating the metabolic pathway is the product inhibition, in which case enzyme is inhibited by its immediate product. So an example is a hexokinase, which catalyzes the reaction in this glucose and ATP to the glucose 6-phosphate and the ATP. This um, reaction is highly exergonic steps. So the, um, this step will happen really a lot uh, with the, again, um, as we've seen with the negative um, uh, Gibbs free energy values. So um, this uh, steps should be regulated and it's often regulated in the cells. So the hexokinase reaction in the forward direction here is specifically inhibited by the, um, its product glucose 6 phosphate. Um, so uh, to the, um, the hexokinase using the um, allosteric mechanisms that we are going to discuss later in this lecture. There are largely three types of spatial organization of enzymes in the pathways. The first one is in the case where the individual enzymes are separate. And in that case, the substrates and intermediates must diffuse in between steps from one um, enzyme to the, to the next enzyme. The second one will be the multi-enzyme complex, which is easy to regulate um, all the, um, the pathways accordingly because all the enzymes and substrates will be within a complex. And it provides an opportunity for substrate channeling, um, which is a sort of a streamlining of the pathways. So it's uh, the same as the assembly line, that everything works on the, um, that, uh, uh, the, same, uh, on the, um, the same space pretty quickly. And the last one will be the special case um, where the, um, the enzymes are bound on the, um, the membrane. So it's called the membrane bound enzyme system. And an example will be a respiratory chain on the, um, in the mitochondria. And in this case, diffusion is minimal. The diffusion for enzyme as well as the substrate is minimal because the most events occur in the large complexes. And also, um, it is, uh, the diffusion is limited to the um, two-dimensional space because everything is bound on the membrane, but not the um, three-dimensional space, just like the, um, the free soluble enzymes. There are several ways to regulate the enzymes in the metabolic pathways. 
you can change the um, availability of enzymes. So the cells increase or decrease the rate of synthesis of such enzymes at mRNA or protein level, which is uh, for the transcription or the translation respectively, or the cells can increase or decrease the rate of the degradation of the enzymes at the mRNA or protein level too. And these are the subject of the, um, the molecular biology or molecular genetics. And also, the, um, the cells can uh, change the, um, or regulate the um, enzymatic activities. And there are five, largely five different methods to do so. The first one is allosteric enzymes, where the enzymes can be regulated by binding of a small molecule to allosteric sites, which can be the, um, the active site or somewhere else. And the effector, which is binding to the um, allosteric site on the, um, that particular enzyme, can be the substrate in which, uh, in case of uh, homotropic allosteric enzymes, or can be a different molecule for the heterotropic allosteric enzymes. And another way to um, regulate the, um, the activity of the enzyme will be by the reversible covalent modifications of enzymes. And um, examples are the phosphorylation of the enzyme, or the, um, uh, it can be some other post-translational -translat modifications, such as acetylations, glycosylations, and so on. And um, uh, the activity can be regulated by the, um, the reversible binding of other proteins, such as control proteins, too. And also by irreversible covalent modifications, such as polylytic cleavage. And finally, by the, um, the change of the localization of the enzymes, too. So um, from now on, we're going to look at all these different methods to regulate the, um, the enzyme activities. First, the method to regulate the enzymatic activity was using the allosteric, which means other shape. And that provides a way to fine tune the enzyme's activity. So the enzyme acquires other shape due to the binding of a modulator or an effector. And that's similar to the TR transition in the hemoglobin, which made it easier for the other subunit to bind to the oxygen after binding of the, um, the first oxygen of the molecule to the complex. Um, uh, in the, um, the uh, allosteric um, uh, enzymes, and the changes in the conformation of one subunit affects the, um, the other subunits in multi-subunit enzymes. And in often time, they have separate regulatory and catalytic subunits um, in that complex. And modulators or the effectors can be either activators or inhibitors for the enzymes. And modulators can be the same molecule as the substrate, like I told you, um, for the um, homotropic um, enzyme, or the, um, the different molecules in case of heterotropic enzymes. Allosteric enzymes often have an unusual kinetic behavior, which you can see in the substrate saturation curve, which shows the, um, the ratio of the rate and the substrate concentration. And instead of having this kind of hi normal hyperbola, you can have a, a different peculiar uh, pattern, such as a sigmoidal curve. And the, um, such uh, changes in the, um, the saturation curve um, is an indicative of a positive cooperativity in multi-subunit homotropic enzyme, such as hemoglobin, that is um, where the, um, the oxygen is binding to it, and binding of a substrate to one subunit within this enzyme complex, or the, um, the uh, subunit of the enzyme, will promote the um, binding of another substrate to the um, other site, um, because there are going to be a conformational changes in the enzyme, which will lead to the, um, the uh, higher affinity of the, such enzymes to the substrate. And when you look at the, um, this uh, 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 curve in the line river bird plot or double reciprocal plot, most allosteric effectors affect KM value depending on the, um, their um, uh, property, uh, if that's inhibitor or the, um, the activator, it can either decrease or increase KM values, which can change this curve of the, um, this, um, the uh, uh, relationship between the, um, the radii and the, um, the substrate concentration. But also some um, allosteric factors can change the Vmax value too.
There are two models to explain the um, LS theory of the enzyme. One is Monod Wyman Shange model, where it proposed the, um, the symmetry model and the, um, the, all the subunits changes simultaneously in a concerted manner. So from T states to the R state here, they're going to change all together upon the, um, the binding of substrates. And the other model is Koshland model, where the, um, it proposed the sequential changes. So the subunits will flip individually from one state to the other. The second method for regulating the enzymatic activity is the reversible covalent modification. And it works more like the um, on-off switch or the um, high-low high function switch. And the uh, typical groups that are added as the modifications are phosphate, AMP, UMP, ADP ribose, as well as methyl group onto the, um, the, these um, amino acids on the uh, enzymes. And a classical example for such um, covalent modifications for uh, the regulating enzyme um, activity would be the glycogen phosphorylase. And it um, roughly looks like this. So it has the, um, the enzymatic, the active site located here, but on the other side, there's an allosteric vector site that can lead to the, um, the conformation change of these two subunits. So um, it works, the, um, the, uh, basically this um, activity is regulated by the phosphorylation. So on phosphorylated form, which is glycogen phosphorylase B, would be a uh, relatively inactive as opposed to phosphorylated form, which is A, will be more active. And these modifications on glycogen phosphorylase, especially phosphorylation, is catalyzed by glycogen phosphorylase kinase and the glycogen phosphorylase phosphatases. So the kinase basically adds the, um, the phosphate onto this um, its um, substrate, which is glycogen phosphorylase, as opposed to phosphat uh, phosphatase, removes the, um, the phosphate groups of the, um, the substrate to uh, make it become uh, the, um, the inactive form of the glycogen phosphorylase. And these forms differ in quaternary structure. So the active site, especially um, uh, their structure, is changed upon the, um, the phosphorylation, which leads to the, um, the changes in the, um, the activity of such um, enzyme. And the breakdown of glycogen is partially controlled through this um, AB ratio. And glycogen phosphorylase B especially, which um, is supposed to be inactive form, is also an allosteric enzyme. So the, um, this B can be activated by the, um, the uh, binding of AMP. And the rest of the methods that regulate the enzymatic activity are reversible binding of other proteins, such as control proteins, to the enzyme irreversible covalent modifications such as prolylytic cleavage and the, um, the uh, changing the localization of the enzyme. And actually all these three methods and the, um, the uh, mechanisms occur in serine proteases of, of the, um, the digestive system that we already discussed in the, um, the earlier um, lectures, which are trypsin, chymotrypsin, and elastase. And they are the, um, the great digestive team because they have different specialties um, for the, um, the, uh, uh, breaking down the, um, the specific amino acid, the peptide bonds. And the, um, they are made in pancreas and then secreted in the small intestine when needed. So they change the localization for their enzymatic re um, activity. So an example of enzymatic activity regulation that uses reversible binding of the protein would be the pancreatic trypsin um, inhibitor, which is a 6 kilodalton polypeptide, and that tightly binds to the, um, the active site of the trypsin and prevent that trypsin from the, um, the premature activation and the, um, eventually digesting just um, in a, a bad timing. And the, um, the next uh, method, which is irreversible covalent modification, is used during the cascade of a prolytic activation. And in there, a lot of um, enzymes, especially serine proteases, are made as an inactive precursors, which are cymosins. And upon the hormone release, the enteropeptidase activates the um, trypsinogen into 
trips in um, using the um, the proteolysis and then this trypsin also cleaves the um, the chymotrypsinogen proelastase and the, um, uh, itself the trypsinogen 2 by specific proteolysis for activation of such um, proteases and um, also the, um, the uh, uh, serine proteases uses the change of the localization of the enzyme for their activity control so the um, such um, enzymes are made in the exocrine cells of pancreas and then stored in zymosin granules and um, the release actually occurs upon the, um, the cell activation and um, in in which case the vesicles diffuse with the plasma membrane and the, um, the ready to be excreted in there and the contents is released into the duodenum which is an upper part of the small intestine metabolic processes take place inside of the cells both in animal cells as well as plant cells and especially the mitochondria or the, um, the uh, chloroplasts play a critical role in metabolic processes where they generate um, energy or the, um, the ATP and we're going to discuss much more in depth about such metabolic processes in the cell in the, um, the later of this section now let's shift the gear and focus more on the chemistry that is important for the metabolism and understanding their mechanisms especially the carbon is very important because that accounts for over half the dry weight of, of the cell and carbon atom has an interesting properties so the carbon can form single bond with the hydrogen atoms and also carbon can form single and double bonds with the oxygens and nitrogens and carbon atoms share electron pairs with each other too to form this carbon carbon bonds and uh, each carbon atoms can form single bonds with the one, two, three, and four ca um, other carbon atoms because they um, have the carbon atom has the four um, electrons that can make pairs. And two carbon atoms can share two electron pairs forming the double bonds, or they can share the three electron pairs forming triple bonds. And these are the critical functional groups um, the, where the, um, the carbon atoms are involved and we already talked about this earlier in this course so you should be able to identify all these uh, groups such as hydroxyl group, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfide group as, as well as some different kinds of bondings too. And a lot of the molecules and metabolites in metabolism contain uh, those um, critical functional groups. Here's an example. Um, what you're seeing here is the coenzyme A, which contains the panothenic acid, which is a vitamin, as well as a thiol group. And in this um, case, especially the set of coenzyme A, um, has the, um, the acyl group that is covalently linked to the, um, this thiol group to form the diester bond here. And also this um, coenzyme um, A contains a lot of important functional groups such as amidos, methyl groups, hydroxyl groups, uh, phosphoanhydride, imidazole, um, amino groups, as well as phosphoryl groups. The carbon in the functional groups containing carbon can be oxidated or reduced and there are five oxidation states of carbon depending on the elements with which carbon shares electrons. So here um, I listed the um, five different kinds of um, carbon um, substance here which is alkane containing the methyl group, alcohol, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, and carbon dioxide. And each component below, for example, alcohol below alkane, is the form by the oxidation of the carbon in the compound above it. So as it gets to the, um, the bottom of this list, there are going to be more oxidation happens. And oxidation is basically by the definition of Lewis acid base um, relationship or the definition. It's the, um, the loss of electrons of that particular um, atom, which is carbon in this case. And carbon dioxide, which is on the bottom of this list, is the most oxidized form of the carbon found in living organisms. And when you look at the, um, this um, oxidation of carbon, they are actually de different depending on the, um, what they are having covalent bond with. 
So in case of carbon-hydrogen bonds, the more electronegative carbon owns the, um, the two electrons shared with the hydrogen. So that means it actually extracts more uh, or contains more uh, electrons uh, compared to the, um, the carbon state without hydrogen. So that's going to be the, um, the reduction of the, um, the carbon atom, as opposed to um, in the carbon-oxygen bonds. Now, electron sharing is, again, unequal, but in favor of oxygen, because oxygen is more electronegative. So it will um, strip the, um, the oxygen a little bit from this carbon. Um, so the carbon will be uh, uh, gone through the, um, the oxidation in this case. And this oxidation is important for the living system to sustain a life because oxidation reactions generally release energy. So it's an exergonic process in many cases. Most of living cells obtain the energy needed for cellular work by oxidizing metabolic fuels. And the energy yielding um, pathway of metabolism, which is catabolic pathways, are the oxidative reaction sequences that result in the transfer of electrons from fuel molecules through the, um, the series of electron carriers such as NAD and FAD, and finally um, to the, um, the oxygen. Oxidation reduction reactions, which is also called as redox reactions, involve electron transfer. So in such reactions, some molecules um, are going to be oxidized, meaning that they're going to lose electrons, as opposed to some molecules will gain or um, are going to be reduced, meaning that they're gaining the electrons. And when you look at the, um, this redox reaction, a molecule that actually gives up the, um, the electrons, so loses electrons, will be called as reducing agent, and that's basically going to be oxidized, as opposed to the, um, the molecule that gains the, um, the electrons will be call, called as oxidizing agent, and it will be reduced. And you can see the half reaction of each in here on the right panel. And in many biological oxidations, a compound loses two electrons and two hydrogen ions. So that's equivalent to two hydrogen atoms rather than just electrons. And these reactions are commonly called dehydrogenations. And the enzymes that catalyze these reactions, dehydrogenations, are called dehydrogenases. And every oxidation must be accompanied by the reduction in which an electron acceptor acquires the electrons removed by oxidation. So these half reactions have to be coupled to complete this redox reaction. And an example of the redox reaction is an oxidation of lactate to pyruvate. And two electrons and two hydrogen ions, which are again the two hydrogen atoms equivalent, are removed from the C2 of lactate. So it changes from the, um, the um, hydroxyl group to the, um, this um, hydrogen. But the, um, where do these um, two electrons go then? It actually is um, uh, uh, accepted by the, um, the uh, electron carrier called NAD+. So this NAD+, takes those two electrons to be reduced to NADH. Um, and in that case, lactate can be um, uh, converted to the, um, the pyruvate. And the, um, in the reverse reaction, um, where the pyruvate becomes the, um, the uh, lactate, here the pyruvate now can be reduced and the, um, the NADH can be oxidized into NAD+. So it loses the, um, the electron and provides the electrons to pyruvate to become the lactate. Oxidation requires the specialized electron carriers in the cell, such as coenzyme NAD plus and FAD, which are the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and the flavin adenine dinucleotide. And you can see their structures here for the FAD and NAD, as well as their conversion for their reduction. As you can see, they take up the, um, the proton, which is a hydrogen ion, as well as electron, to become the um, FAD or the FADH2, or from NAD plus to the, um, the NADH. And note that the, um, the proton, the hydrogen, um, 
uh, ion is soluble in aqueous solution, but the electron is insoluble in aqueous solution, meaning that the, um, um, you can release the, um, uh, the hydrogen atom, uh, hydrogen ion, onto the, um, the water um, as a product here, but the um, electron will not go anywhere, so it, ha it must be um, transferred by the um, uh, help of this electron carrier, which are the, um, the NAD plus and FAD. So they again play a critical role in terms of oxidation and reduction. Besides the electron carriers for the oxidation reduction reactions, there is a subclass of enzymes that carry out redox reactions in which molecular oxygen is a participant, and they are the oxidases and oxygenases. Oxidases are the enzymes in the catalyze oxidation reactions in which molecular oxygen serves as the electron acceptor, but neither of the oxygen atoms is incorporated into the product. And an example would be this glucose oxidase. And again, as you can see, oxygen uh, molecules are not going to be incorporated into the, um, the substrate here for the enzyme, but it will stay out of it. As opposed to oxygenases is, um, are the, um, the enzymes that catalyze reactions in which oxygen atoms are directly incorporated into the product, forming a new hydroxyl or carboxyl groups. And an example would be this uh, toluene um, uh, oxygenase, where the, um, the, this um, benzene ring will um, have two hydroxyl groups.